Testament to testimony to um, to Ziad's work and his passion uh, for talking about Syria. So I wanted to start by saying that in mid-December, by chance, I happened to be about a hundred miles from Aleppo, where I was that very week that the city fell to Assad's forces. There was no CNN, there was no BBC, and I was watching most of what happened that week, watching that abandoned population try to communicate with the world. If you saw maps of Aleppo at that time, you saw the little tiny bit of it to which the citizens were, ordinary citizens were reduced in those last days before Aleppo fell. It was devastating to me to watch, and believe me, we didn't see the half of it on television in Europe or in the United States. So I resolved that day when I got back to campus that I would talk to Ziad, whom I've heard speak on this topic before, and ask him to give a public lecture while the trustees were here, and by the way, everybody on campus, the trustees are here, so hold your hands up, trustees, or stand up for a minute so everybody can see you. And we're thrilled to have the board here and also for the board to be able to get an opportunity over this weekend. They've had several opportunities to meet business faculty earlier today and politics department tomorrow and, and tonight, the opportunity to hear from Zia. So, um, what I wanted to just quickly say was that Professor Majid teaches Middle Eastern studies and writes on Lebanese, Syrian, and Arab affairs, as well as on regional political transitions and crises. In 2004, you co-founded the Democratic Left Movement along with the late Samir Kassir, Elias Khoury, and many intellectuals, politicians, students, and militants, and you participated in the independence uprising in March 2005. In 2007, you co-founded the Arab Network for the Study of Democracy. The network gathers scholars and activists from 11 different Arab countries and publishes newsletters, research notes, and policy papers on current developments in the Middle East. In 2009, uh, you joined New Lebanon, where I believe you still write a weekly column. And uh, uh, Ziad's latest publication, which I think a number of you know, is called Syrie, la Révolution Orpheline, Syria, the Orphan Revolution. Paris 2014, and the book, of course, analyzes the origins and evolution of this conflict, probably the most tragic and complex conflict of our age, and also this ongoing struggle for Syria. So without further ado, we want to hear from you. Really. Thank you, Zed. Thank you so much, uh, Celeste. I'm really thankful and grateful uh, and I'm very honored uh, to speak tonight to talk about this uh, topic uh, that unfortunately is still an extremely sad and tragic topic when it comes to the general situation or even when it comes to my uh, personal connection uh, with Syria and with the Syrians. And I see already in, uh, in the audience many of the Syrian students who are now at AUP or uh, some of their friends who are uh, just uh, attending. Uh, what I'll try to do in, let's say, 35 minutes is to talk first about the context in which Arab revolutions and the Syrian revolution took place, uh, then to talk about Syria and the Syrian conflict today uh, in six phases. Uh, it happened, it's a coincidence, it happened and it's a coincidence uh, that uh, each summer in Syria since 2011, we have been, uh, let's say, witnessing a kind of a turning point and a new configuration each time is emerging and is modifying many of the parameters and of the factors of the, of, of the conflict. And then in, in a third time, uh, I'll talk about Syria and, and, and the international community. Why does Syria today uh, create or ask or uh, pose lots of questions on our solidarity, on the international community's responsibility and reaction to the Syrian disaster, on the Security Council that we saw as incapable of dealing with that conflict, and does this reveal something new in the world of today, in this, uh, let's say, the end of a cycle in the world that we are also observing in different electoral results, in different uh, uh, political sociologies evolving in different places in this world? 
So allow me to start just by uh, this picture that was the, the poster used. I don't know, I, we might not see it very uh, clearly. Uh, it's done by an artist, uh, Tamam Azam, that I will show some of his work later because I think arts played an important role in communicating with the world what was happening in Syria and there was a reason for that. So this is by uh, a young Syrian artist who just tried to show Syria as part of this planet, even if it has been forgotten for some time, at least uh, since 1970, I might say, since the arrival of the Assad family to power following a military coup uh, in uh, March uh, 1970. So what is the uh, historical moment that we have been living through since 2010? There are five founding moments in the current history or in the modern history of the Middle East. The first one, as many of the students who are taking Middle East course uh, have been uh, uh, following, the first moment is the 1915-1920. This is the moment when the Ottoman Empire collapsed. It, it started with a decline, of course, during the First World War, and then it collapsed during that war and after the war. And this is also the rise of colonial powers, France and Britain in the Levant, in the region, uh, first with the McMahon Hussein correspondence, in which the British promised the governor of the Hejaz area, which was in the Arabian Peninsula, that he might become king of Arabs if he helped them, if he helped them against the Ottoman authorities by declaring a revolution, an Arab revolution, that might also delegitimize the Ottomans when it comes to the Islamic uh, connotation of their rule, since he is the governor of Hejaz where Mecca and Medina, the two holy cities of Islam, are. So that was the first correspondence, except that uh, Hussein, who agreed and who went into his uprising, uh, was met one year later with a terrible surprise for him, which is the Sykes-Picot Agreement, Sykes-Picot Agreement between the British Sykes and the French Picot, who decided to redraw the map of the Middle East by giving uh, uh, Syria and Lebanon to the French mandate, uh, Palestine, Jordan, and Iraq to the British mandate with, with some nuances. And at the same time, there will be a series of conferences following that that will draw the lines and will uh, make that project a concrete one uh, on the ground. And it will be followed by the beginning of what we might call uh, nation state building in all of those uh, countries. Except that also uh, with this series of promises and agreements, one year later, in 1917, uh, Lord Balfour of Britain uh, promised the Zionist movement, the Jewish nationalist movement, that they would be allowed to build a nation state uh, in Palestine. So there would be a series of conflicting promises, betrayals, and that will lead to the beginning of what we uh, might call, or, or what many call, the uh, question of the Orient or the Oriental question, with all its complexities and possible conflicts that might take place. So that was the first important moment. The second one was the 1947-1949 uh, process leading to the creation of the State of Israel, starting with the UN resolution, then with the conflict, and it is the beginning as well of the Arab-Israeli conflict, a conflict that is unfortunately ongoing, uh, but it is also the moment that will allow many military elites in different Arab countries to seize power with the justification that they are doing that in order to fight for Palestine. So the beginning of military rules, whether in Egypt with Nasser, or uh, in Syria with the Ba'ath party that will bring Assad to power, uh, or Gaddafi in Libya, Numairi in Sudan, uh, Saleh in Yemen, uh, all of them, uh, Qasim in Iraq, all of them, military coup will remove existing ruling elites, whether in republics or in monarchies, and impose the state of emergency, impose the military rule, and in many cases, the one-party system. That started already in the 50s, and it continued as a tendency in, in many Arab countries until the late 70s. So uh, what is important in, in that moment is not only the disastrous Arab-Israeli conflict, but it is also the dynamics, the political ones that it created in different Arab societies, and they will have, of course, their implications. A third moment, and I will go very fast now, 1973, it's an important moment because this is the last war between Arab states and Israel. Following that war, on the Arab side, it will be non-state actors who will be fighting the Israeli state with the PLO, and then with the Lebanese Hezbollah, then with Hamas. We don't have any more states in the war. 73 was the last one, and that is important when it comes to the conflict itself. But more important, 73 is the oil boom that will allow for the Gulf region, uh, and mainly for Saudi Arabia, to become an important actor on the regional scene. And that will also lead 
to the beginning of the rise of what many will call political Islam, meaning those forces that will consider Islam not only a spiritual or a social, uh, let's say, religion uh, with rituals, with uh, kind of a cohesion in the society, they will also consider that Islam is a political project that can regulate and that can allow for governance based on its doctrine, based on its sharia and on its many texts. So this was also an important moment that will be followed by the fourth one, the 1979 Iranian revolution. This is the Shia part of the Muslim world with an, uh, a revolution that will topple the, the Shah of Iran, the monarch, and will establish what will be called the Islamic Republic, which is the principle of Shia Islam combined with a Republican system. And that will lead as well with the ideology of exporting the revolution to creating uh, what is called revolutionary parties in different places. Hezbollah in Lebanon is one of them. Wh wherever there are Shia communities, the Iranians will, will try to invest and to create alliances in order to have a better control of the region in a way. And that will be met with a Saudi response and with an Islamist Sunni response that will try to create a balance. And for the first time after 79, we will start witnessing new terminology that is more and more based on Islam rather than on the secular constitutions that existed in the post-mandate or post-colonial uh, Middle East. In addition to that, also by coincidence, but uh, a, a, a terrible coincidence in a way, the jihad in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union within the context of the Cold War will start because the Soviets invaded Afghan in the same year. And this is when Al-Qaeda will be founded uh, and will be used in a way against the Soviet army in order to weaken the Soviet Union and to trap it in Afghanistan. So this was a turning point because it will be followed by the Iraq-Iran war, and then by the Iraq invasion of Kuwait, then by the Desert Storm operation, which is the US intervention against Iraqi forces. So all of that will lead to a series of war. And finally, in 2010, 2011, Arab societies, after witnessing all those conflicts, after living under dictatorship for many, many decades, if we just look at the years in which uh, all presidents took place, Gaddafi, 1969, Assad, father, 1970, and, and son, 2000. Uh, Mubarak, 1981. Ali Abdullah Saleh of Yemen, 1978. Uh, you can add, all of them came to power, and they decided to stay in power until the end. In fact, many of their slogans were about ending with time, controlling time, so that their rule will become eternal. So in Egypt, things will start, in, in Tunisia first, in late 2010, under Ben Ali, who seized power in 1987. So in 2010, we are already in, what, 87, 13, 23 years. The first revolution will be uh, more or less successful with, with uh, uh, some violence, but not uh, large-scale violence, uh, due to the fact that the middle class was a uh, large middle class. Urbanization in Tunisia is important. The level of education is not bad. And the army was not the strongest actor, so it preferred to sacrifice the president rather than cracking down on the uh, masses in the streets. Followed by Egypt, 2011. Egypt will have a much more difficult process and then it will be followed by counter-revolution. Then you have Yemen, Bahrain, uh, Libya with Gaddafi since 69. Uh, Yemen, as we said, Saleh from 78. And finally, Syria. Syria will be the big surprise of the Arab revolutions, not because people were not expecting that things will happen in Syria, but because they thought it would be much more difficult First, due to the location, the geography of Syria, it's on the Israeli border, it's on the Turkish border, it's on the Iraqi border where already there was war going on since the uh, invasion and the end of the Saddam's rule. So Syria was a surprise also because the regime there is not only into symbolic repression, it has a history of very violent repression. Hama in 1982, Hama is the fourth a Syrian city witnessed already a massacre, uh, killing more than 30,000 civilians uh, and without an international reaction at the time because the target supposedly was the Muslim Brotherhood. So many uh, just closed their eyes considering that as long as the enemy is an Islamist, it's fine that human rights violation might take, care on, uh, might take place sorry, on large scale. So that incident of Hama, I will go back to it because it is for the Syrian a trauma uh, that will follow that massacre uh, with the silence and the taboo, even in Syria to talk about it, will disappear with this revolution of 2011. But unfortunately, and I pass here to the second point, unfortunately that revolution will also turn into an armed conflict and later into a full-scale war involving regional but also international actors. The first 
phase of that revolution is March, August 2011. We're talking here about a peaceful mobilization, about hundreds of thousands of people in the streets calling for the end of the state of emergency, calling for the liberation of the political prisoners, for the return of all those who are in exile, and uh, for freedoms that will be later, uh, in fact, they will start also calling for the end of the regime, the end of the Assad dynasty, as they call it. And in the case of Syria, it is the second case in the world, in the Republic, that a president gives power to his son. And the first case is North Korea. After that, there will be other cases in Gabon uh, in, and in some Central Asian places. But Syria was the second in 2000, after 30 years of the rule of Hafs al-Assad, the father, he gave power to his son, who did not even have the constitutional age at the time, who was 34, while the English constitution stipulates that the age of presidency is 40. So, in a few minutes, in fact, it was a record, a world record, the parliament modified the constitution and made the age of presidency 34, allowing Bashar to become president, not in elections, because never uh, Syria witnessed elections. There is in Syria what is called the presidential referendum. You have one candidate and you vote with yes or no. Uh, and, and the joke in Syria is that you have to, to vote with yes and two yes. Because the no, uh, if you look at the results, officially the results are 99.99. .99. 99.97. <laughs> they were not like, arrogant enough to say 100%, but almost. So it was 99.99%. The revolution started peaceful until August. As of September 2011, people considered that the armed struggle is the only way to end with that regime because peaceful mobilization did not threaten it since the army immediately was used against the demonstrations, and that was different from Tunisia, and the army remained in its majority loyal to the regime, because also the social uh, context in Syria, the society is different than the most homogeneous society in Tunisia, whether when it comes to the sectarian question, uh, the Syrian regime or, or uh, the Assad family belongs to the Alawite sect that uh, is almost 10% of the population. Uh, the majority is a Muslim Sunni, but also there are other minorities, Christian minorities, uh, there are ethnic questions in Syria, Arabic, uh, Arab and Kurdish populations. So all of that made the situation much more difficult. And the regime already established a basis within the minorities in order to say that the regime protects those minorities against the Muslim majority. So they played on the sectarian question. And that, unfortunately, allowed the army to remain more or less a unified one defending the regime, with some exceptions and with those who will constitute the first uh, a rebellion, a military one, the Free Syrian Army, that will start fighting the regime. We move to the second uh, phase of the conflict, is July 2012, because the opposition tried to seize Damascus and Aleppo, the two largest cities of the country. They failed in Damascus, they controlled half of Aleppo, and for the first time the regime started using its air force. And that was a turning point, because at the time, the Syrian opposition, as well as many Arab countries, asked the US and the international community to impose a no-fly zone over Syria in order to avoid what might be the Air Force decisive factor in the uh, conflict. Unfortunately, the US and the international community, for the different reasons, they did not accept to have the no-fly zone, which allowed Assad to use the uh, sky of Syria to bomb his own people, and the conflict would continue until August 2013, when in uh, August 21st, uh, the chemical attack on the, civil on the civilian population of the Ghouta of Damascus happened and the uh, chemical weapon was the only red line set by President Obama uh, for Syria saying that if this red line is violated he will take some measures or he will do something. Except that once again unfortunately nothing happened. Uh, there will be a deal between the US and Russia and after uh, Assad denying that he has chemical weapons he finally accepted to give to the international uh, agency of, uh, that works against chemical weapons 1,500 tons of uh, sarin gas, the sarin gas that was used in that attack that killed more than 1,400 civilians. And we reached a very weird or strange basis in international law. If the accused of committing crime surrenders the weapon of the crime, then nothing will happen against him, then no measure will be taken. And that created a, a kind of impunity for war crimes in Syria that will only uh, take place more and more on a regular basis. The next uh, phase is September 2013 until July 2014. July 2014, you all heard about uh, Baghdadi, 
who decided to declare that he is the commander of the faithful, that he is the new caliph of the Muslims, and he established the so-called Islamic State or Daesh in Iraq and parts of Syria, in parts of Iraq and parts of Syria. And of course, uh, Daesh with the spectacular barbaric violence that it committed, uh, with this also society of watching television uh, and wars as if we are in a reality show, Daesh was capable of attracting uh, lots of media, of attracting in the West especially, all those who were horrified by scenes of uh, killing someone, uh, burning him, uh, decapitation, etc. And that, uh, when it comes to Syria, was also capable of hiding abstract death that was caused by airplanes, by modern weapons, and the barbaric uh, crimes of Daesh will seize the attention of media and will, uh, will hide the Syrian people and will hide other crimes taking place in Syria and will lead to US intervention, but this time not against Assad, only against Daesh, that will start in August 2014, and the US will be bombing Daesh. That will continue without an end to the conflict because all uh, reasons for that conflict were still there until September 2015, which is the Russian intervention. Russia intervened in Syria after Iran already intervened to support the Assad regime and to save it and to create as well a balance of power on the international scene, showing that Moscow is back and that Putin will not al allow anymore the West to decide on conflicts without his blessing or at least without his approval and his partnership. So Syria witnessed all that. And finally, in July 2016, the Battle of Aleppo started and ended in December when you were uh, close to the region, ended with the control of Aleppo by the regime and its allies following a siege and following an intensive Russian uh, bombardment that targeted, in fact, according to Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, targeted more than 15 hospitals and uh, dispensaries in Aleppo in order to make the life of civilians impossible so that they will move they will be, in a way, deported from the city. These are pictures, quickly, from the uh, early phase of the revolution, when it was a peaceful. Uh, this is the city of Hama, that was a martyr city in the 80s, that had the largest demonstrations in Syria. Uh, this is in Dara, in the south, from where our friend Muhammad was here, uh, uh, is originally. Uh, this is also in the south of Syria, with the destruction of uh, the statues of Assad, who were everywhere, and to show 1985 under the movie or the Big Brother, to show that they are always witnessing, they are always observing and spying people, and they control the public space. This is funerals, and I always try to explain to demystify the rise of Islamization in many of the societies that are under death and conflict. The ritual of death, the hundreds of funerals a week, the fact that parents are losing their children, always create more and more connection to metaphysics, more and more connection to what might be considered as a divine justice, the fact that we might meet once again in paradise. So all of that contributed also through the conflict to a kind of a social Islamization in Syria, especially in rural areas where death toll reached in some days more than 200 a day. Plus, if you can just imagine uh, children or adolescents who were 11 years, 12 years, 13 years in 2011, and they are now 18, 17, 19, no schools anymore, no universities anymore in those areas that are besieged and bombed, uh, no possibilities to find a job, no possibilities to have a recreational activity, definitely also either the mosque or the network of those fighters that are established in their area will attract them and will mobilize them, and also with time, a kind of an ideology might emerge related either to nihilism or to the rejection of the whole world that has been unfair to us, or this will to continue the fight until the end. So the radicalization has also, uh, we, we might demystify it, it's not only about reading a text and becoming radical or extremist or reactionary the second day. It's, it's a process and through a war, that process is unfortunately always a big potential and possibility. So. Then if you see the scenes of the destruction when we moved into the full-scale war, Aleppo and many places remind us of, of uh, pictures from the Second World War, and this is again in Aleppo. Uh, but during this war, and in, in, uh, as in many other wars, there will be resilience, there will be resistance from what remains of the civil society. So this is the White Helmets, for uh, is now well known. Uh, it's an example, and they were nominated for the Nobel uh, Prize for Peace. The White Helmets are those who work on 
saving people from under the, the rubble, from under the buildings that uh, collapsed due to the uh, bombing or due to the air raids. And they are considered by many Syrians as the heroes of the Syrian civil society. Uh, but at the same time, everyone is looking to the sky because death uh, comes from the sky, from the airplanes. You know what is this? This is a queue to get bread and water in one besieged area in southern Damascus in a Palestinian refugee camp called the Yarmouk camp, where Palestinian refugees came in 49 and established themselves in the southern part of Damascus. They were besieged for three years by the uh, Syrian army and the UN used to distribute weekly uh, bread, uh, milk and some aspirin and, and some medicines. And these are pictures taken by, by Reuters of the queues waiting for uh, just those uh, humanitarian help from the UN. This is another picture reminding a bit of the concentration camp in a way and the survivors of, of the, the survivors of those camps. Now what is this humanitarian disaster in Syria? Syria is uh, 23 million people, country, 13 million of them are today displaced. 6 million outside the country and 7 million are internally displaced and that's why the UNHCR qualified Syria as the worst humanitarian disaster since Second World War. Not because there were no other tragedies and disasters in the world. We all remember the genocide in uh, Rwanda. We know what happened in Bosnia and in the Balkan area. There are many tragic events taking place in Central Africa today. Uh, there are lots of crimes, but when it comes to the proportion to the, to the population, this is the worst crime since 45. So 13 million out of 23 million Syrians do not live at home uh, today in uh, January 26th. 2017, and countries like Lebanon uh, have today more than 20% of their population, uh, a refugee population. Out of the 6 million Syrians who left Syria, there are 1.1 million in Lebanon, 2.8 million in Turkey, 250,000 in northern Iraq, 700,000 in Jordan, 130,000 in Egypt, and a million who are in Europe and the rest of the world. Half of those who are outside the Middle East are in Germany. Uh, France has 14,000 only, and you can hear the political debate about the fear from refugees and etc. So it is uh, quite a disaster for the Syrian when it comes to that displacement. The destructions are terrible destruction of the infrastructure, and in the world of today, we're not sure that a martial plan will be possible, like the one that followed the Second World War. So the reconstruction of Syria will be a painful and a difficult process, uh, not to talk about whether it will start or not one day. Sieges and starvation, according to the UN, more than 800,000 people are still under siege in Syria, in areas, towns and villages that are isolated from the rest of the country. The death toll and its responsibility, plus the industry of death in jails. This is a, a, a picture, or this is what the Syrian Network for Human Rights established regularly. They established that uh, in November, so before the Battle of Aleppo became uh, the ruthless one. It shows how all parties were responsible of war crimes, but of course, no comparison between the responsibility of the regime. 92% of the civilian losses were uh, killed under the regime uh, fire. Uh, Daesh killed around 1.48% uh, of the victims. The Russian forces, 1.75. The opposition factions, because opposition factions are different than Daesh, 1.81, etc., etc. Now, the Hamat Roma that I mentioned, that city and the documentation, in 2011, the Syrians thought that this time the world will not remain silent if they are massacred again, as this world stayed silent in 1982. So they tried to document all what has happening, and Syria is probably the most documented conflict today. Maybe not the best documented, because there are always uh, propagandas in the documentation, but it is the most documented conflict. And also, it's the conflict with the uh, probably the most artistic creativity in order to respond to death by arts. But by doing so as well, they tried to address the world, to talk to the world that we are part of this planet. So they brought Klimt, the famous uh, work of Klimt, on one of the, you see the building in Homs, the city of Homs, uh, that was uh, targeted by, by bullets. They brought Goya, the Spanish painter, to uh, the city of Aleppo. Uh, they have this uh, the screen uh, put in the Syrian context and uh, many artists as well from the new generation this is a work by uh, Randam Dah uh, tried as well to illustrate death 
life resilience in their work. However, and once again, when it comes to the international community, I think, and this is the last part, that Syria reveals a certain malaise in the international system today. The Security Council was incapable of dealing with the Syrian crisis. Russia used the veto right <coughs> six times uh, to uh, just to, 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 handic, to create an obstacle to any kind of uh, international interaction, international measure when it comes to the Syrian conflict, and thus they protected, in a way, war crimes that were committed in Syria. So the Middle East has a long and sad story with the veto right. The veto right was used by the US on many occasions when it comes to the Arab-Israeli conflict. And now, since 2011, it has been used regularly by Russia when it comes to the Syrian conflict. And that, whether it's justified or not, this is of course debatable and can be discussed, creates this idea of being outside the international law, that we Middle Eastern, we Arabs, we people with a certain uh, dark skin or with a beard, we might not be protected by international law as others can be and are. And this is, uh, once again, it can be debatable, justified or not, but this is a common feeling. And this is exactly what radicalization and what nihilism and what hating and rejecting the world is about. <laughs> and that's what allow, allows groups like Daesh and Al-Qaeda and other barbaric entities to recruit young, uh, devastated, frustrated uh, people from different countries where conflicts have been taking place for some time and no international reaction are really there to meet with a minimum amount of justice and of the respect of Geneva Conventions, the Charter of Human Rights, uh, all kinds of international mechanisms that can protect civilians are not there. So uh, you have also, when it comes to the world, probably there is a Middle East fatigue. And I understand it. I, I, I keep like uh, giving talks and visiting places. And I see that many people are interested. Many people want to do something. But there is a Middle East fatigue. You come from a region where we only hear about conflicts, about wars. And that, with time, might create, uh, and I'm not saying that this is the intention of those who say that. This is very legitimate to be said in the world of today. But with time, there is something culturalistic about it, as if people in the Middle East are born to kill and to be killed. So if any way you're used to wars, so we cannot do anything. Huh? Or the argument, Syria is too complicated. Well, any country in the world is too complicated for someone who does not follow uh, its uh, stories and daily life and literature and cinema and, and social activities and politics. But there is nothing complicated if we try to reach some information, to read, and there is nothing complicated if we have uh, just the idea of a human rights and international law uh, applied to any place in the world without different standards. Otherwise, we can be with or against that kind of solution. That's another story. But at least impunity should not be there. At least human rights should be a priority, even if there are economic interests, geostrategic interests, all that is part of international relations. But there should be a certain minimum, at least. Otherwise, what is called terrorism will never end because all its roots will continue to uh, recruit people and to create symptoms like Daesh, like Al-Qaeda and the likes. Uh, the Reality shows that I mentioned this, uh, Daesh understood that the world of today is a world of spectacular violence. Now, if you destroy a building and you don't see the bodies, death is abstract, it's part of the war, and people will say this is war. Or if you see them, you prefer not to see them to protect yourself as well, and to protect the, the children at home, you turn off the TV not to show the horror of war. But Daesh understood that some cameras with uh, sound effects with an individual assassination of a person, will always horrify people, will create a kind of voyeurism uh, in front of the TV, and will push some decision makers to react. And that's exactly what they wanted, to trap the media, to trap the decision makers, to say that we are in a war against the whole world because we are the real defenders of Islam, of uh, our just and fair causes, etc. The uh, military force, in Syria now showed to be efficient because Russia, after intervening militarily, saving the regime, is now imposing the conditions for a political solution. This might not work, but they are meeting in Astana, uh, in Kazakhstan, and they will meet again. And they have chosen as well who should represent the Syrians in that political process. So they might bring a certain stability by force, 
after the horrors that were committed, but also this might fail. And once again, the international community will have to deal with its responsibilities. Today, uh, President Trump uh, just mentioned that uh, uh, some protected areas should be established in Syria. That's a new uh, argument or a new suggestion that Turkey and Qatar, for instance, uh, support. Uh, Russia does not support. And Trump has a real contradiction when it comes to his Syrian approach because he says that he will get closer. I'm not talking about the rest. This is your, uh, your questions. Uh, he says that he will uh, have a rapprochement with Moscow and that they should cooperate together. But at the same time, he's very hostile towards Iran. While Iran and, and Russia are working together in Syria on the ground and in politics. So that will be extremely uh, difficult. Uh, to, to deal with how to be anti-Iranian in a way and, and pro-Russian or, or in support of the Russian diplomacy and military acts in Syria, it will be a, a difficult task to, to deal with. Uh, Syria is also the end of the never again. We heard never again after the genocide in Rwanda. We heard never again after Sarajevo. We heard never again after the, the rape uh, in Central Africa and many of the uh, crimes against humanity. But now we are also uh, probably we are expecting after the end of the conflict people saying never again as long as once again impunity will continue to reign in the Middle East this will be a revel again never again sorry might be repeated more and more and finally Syria also uh, paid the price of rumors of the culture of rumors of the fact that on social networks on media uh, on many of the Russian media as well there are lots of rumors that are always uh, sent and uh, many Western public opinions who have uh, a problem with their own establishments, who do not trust the political classes anymore, who do not trust the mainstream media anymore, for different reasons. Some of them might be justified, others are exaggerated, many are related to populism, etc. But all of that was efficient in the Syrian case. So whenever there's a crime, ah, but who said that this is the responsibility of the regime? Whenever there's a problem, there are many rumors that will immediately appear and will create always ambiguities, will create always hesitations, and that was an efficient weapon by the Russian and Iranian propaganda when it comes to Syria. There were, of course, counter propagandas, and sometimes there were other lies also promoted, but the efficiency of the Russian and the Iranian propaganda was by far more important. Finally, today Syria is fragmented. There is a ceasefire. This is the Syrian map. Uh, uh, the yellow part of the map is the area where you have the Kurdish militias controlling northern Syria, and that is alarming uh, the Turkish government because they consider that it might lead to a Kurdish autonomy, which is what they reject. What is in green is the area controlled by the opposition. The opposition was whether secular or Islamist, and I will make a, st a quick distinction between Islamist, and what is in, in gray or, or black, that is the ISIS area, and what is in red is the areas controlled by the regime uh, with the help of Iran and uh, regional militias coming from Lebanon, Iraq, and other places. Now, what is the difference between a jihadist and an Islamist? It's not true that they are the same. Uh, in media, it's always difficult to make distinctions because they want uh, a fast information. A jihadist is someone who is not interested in the territoriality of the conflict. They went to Afghanistan, they went to Iraq, they are now in Syria, in Mali, in Libya. They might travel everywhere where the principle of the jihad, of the holy war, is applied or can be possible. So they declare the jihad on what they consider to be the enemies of Islam, and they travel. They are not interested in the territoriality, in the nationality of the conflict, of the cause, and they are not interested in its temporality. Now, it's not about uh, the fall of the Assad regime. It's not about the fall of Gaddafi. It is about Islam. It's about jihad against the enemies of Islam. While the Islamists, they do consider that Islam is a source of government, but they are interested in having it in Syria, or in Egypt, or in Libya, or in Tunisia, in places where Muslims are the majority. And they are not always into violence. Some of them are, but they are not always into violence. And more important, uh, their political parties have been shaped for the last decades by the different contexts in which they evolved. And they are very different in that sense from the jihadists who are networks, who do not have any concrete uh, state, except now with Baghdadi on, on parts of Iraq and Syria, and who have always been a kind of a virtual Islam, a kind of an Islam going beyond the borders and beyond the national causes. Finally, three pictures for hope. This is in one refugee camp in southern Turkey. Kids are still going to schools due to volunteers who are working in many camps in order to provide education. 
this is also in a refugee camp in Jordan, a girl playing and just having a happy moment, which is extremely important for uh, her own personal freedom. And uh, this is also a picture of hope. Uh, a children who is just uh, who was born again after the uh, Red Cross gave him this artificial leg and uh, you can just see his smile maybe it's not very clear but this is a smile that gives some hope that those people deserve solidarity uh, uh, deserve support and I thank you very much for uh, being here tonight uh, and thank you so I don't know if we have time for some questions, maybe, or some comments. We can take uh, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Questions or comments? Yes, sir. What would you suggest the, uh, the uh, UN or uh, the Western powers should have done uh, pretty late in the game to try and stop things from getting as bad? Mm. Um, well, I, I think that in 2012 there was a golden opportunity. There was uh, there were no jihadists at the time. Daesh was not there. Al Qaeda was very weak, and even the Islamists, the Syrian Islamists, were still very weak group. While the Free Syrian Army represented the majority at the time, what they wanted was either a no-fly zone that would not allow Assad to use his air force or uh, anti-craft missiles. Both uh, demands were rejected by the U.S. In fact. Uh, for, for many reasons. Among them is that um, the Obama administration considered that they don't want to take the risk of having strategic weapons that might be uh, taken by other groups. That argument was not really convincing because uh, most of those new sophisticated weapons can be neutralized by satellites if they change the area where they are or they, they function by digital print. Uh, but more important at the time, the priority of the Obama administration was the uh, nuclear negotiations with Iran. So I think they gave that priority to the priority in Syria, uh, saying that we cannot fight Iran in Syria while negotiating with the Iranian a nuclear deal. And then after 2013, with the rise of Daesh, it became even much more complicated. And the Americans considered that the, wo the war against Daesh in Iraq uh, and, uh, and in Syria itself will be a priority over the Assad question. What can be done now, even if it's a bit too late, but uh, the formula about Assad or Daesh is a very wrong formula. We can always see that there will be no solution as long as Assad in place is in place or Daesh is in place. So the best formula, even if it appears unrealistic today due to the balance of power following the Russian intervention, is neither Assad nor Daesh. A transition, today Turkey and Russia are the two important actors uh, sponsoring the, uh, the, the peace talks. They might have a certain presence in Syria, uh, in order to impose the ceasefire and then to have a decentralized country, not a fragmented or a divided country like it is today, but a form of federal state that will allow a transition and that transition should definitely happen without uh, Assad in order to make the fight <coughs> against Daesh legitimate and efficient. Because as long as Assad is there, many Syrians will be reluctant to die while fighting, fighting Daesh so that Assad will stay and will maintain power for an additional uh, 10 or 15 years. He has been in power for 46 years. The other question that for me is very important is that since it's impossible to have the uh, international uh, justice system functioning due to the possible Russian veto in the uh, Security Council, and since Syria did not join the, the Rome Treaty that will allow immediately the prosecutor to seize the Syrian uh, file and, and judge uh, when it comes to uh, crimes against humanity, is to create, like in the Bosnian case, a special tribunal for Syria in order to investigate war crimes and to show that those war crimes will not remain without any reaction and punishment. That will be a very important signal for the Middle East but also for potential criminals that they cannot continue killing like this and then we will normalize with them as if nothing happened. Uh, some politicians here might say, but you know, Daesh killed French citizens. Daesh came and killed German citizens. Daesh killed uh, uh, Belgian citizens, US citizens. While Assad, he's killing his own people. So it is the Syrian people problem with him. It's not our problem. Yes, this is true, but this is extremely dangerous to say it as if the lives of the Syrians do not count. So if Assad is killing them, it's fine. We will do business with him as long as we have Daesh as the on the enemy. That cannot function because that will feed into Daesh propaganda. And even if Daesh is defeated on the ground, and it will be defeated militarily, but then another Daesh will emerge. Daesh emerged after Al-Qaeda. 
And after Daesh, there will be another similar entity if dictatorship and the absence of the minimum amount of justice and of the respect of international law is there. They are real symptom of diseases in those societies rather than just the, uh, the root of the problem or uh, the reason of that. So I think international justice, a decentralized system, and a peace uh, accord with, even if it would be unfair for many Syrians, uh, but for realism, Russia is there and Turkey is there, it might uh, create a counterbalance, plus some Gulf countries, Iran has interest because this is the access to Lebanon, uh, and without a solution, the refugee crisis will continue, they will not return. Uh, all of those who are in, in many places lost their homes and, and, and there are demographic changes taking place in Syria, so we need that as well to secure the return of the refugees. What is for, for now the priority of Russia is a ceasefire, and they will try to build a process to preserve Assad in place and to preserve their presence as well, counting on the absence of European reaction, and Europe is uh, getting weaker and weaker, and after the Brexit it's even worse. Uh, and uh, America is much more into internal questions. We'll see what will happen now with the administration of President Trump. Yes, sir. Uh, do you see any path to a Kurdish state? Uh, well, uh, f first, I think that uh, Kurds do have all their legitimate rights, and they have been oppressed for decades in Turkey, in Syria, in Iran, and in Iraq. Uh, the Ba'athification and the Arabization uh, that was uh, implemented by force in Kurdish places created lots of, uh, uh, lots of injustices and lots of uh, casualties, lots of uh, tragedies. But today, except from Iraq, where the uh, Iraqi Kurdistan is more or less organized and is, is well-functioned, Arbil and Sulaymaniyah are attracting investments, and things appear to be fine. But this is also temporary, because we don't know how things will evolve later. In the Syrian case, I don't see that this will be possible, because it will lead to many new conflicts. Turkey will not allow it. Iran is not positive about it, because also it has 7% of its own population that is Kurdish. Uh, and it, within the Syrian context, Unfortunately, the old victims, in some cases, um, let's say, did abuse uh, some of their neighbors, Arab neighbors, in many villages in the current uh, Kurdish area. Uh, many Arab tribes were displaced from the area, and uh, many properties were seized by the Kurdish militias, and this created inside Syria a new Kurdish-Arabic uh, tension. I think that they need to have their cultural rights, political rights. This is obvious, it's not that I think this is the, the case. It should be there. But within maybe a federal system, that will not lead to the fragmentation of the territory, because otherwise it might lead to new wars and new conflicts. And anyway, Turkey is intervening militarily in Syria, mainly because of that. They want to push Daesh away from the borders, that's true. But they want definitely also to uh, uh, not to allow the Kurdish militias to have a territorial continuity uh, in northern Syria that will be on their borders, and that will encourage Turkish Kurds also to rise and to stand up, and they are already doing that, and there is already uh, a conflict in southeast Turkey due to that. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you could provide some in insight as to how um, Syrians themselves have been involved in the peace-building efforts in the country, because I feel like there's been kind of more of an emphasis on how Western efforts have been um, emphasize in this country, yeah. but not so much how Syrians themselves have been agents of their own right, and in particular how women have been involved. Yes. Well, this is a very important question, but it will require lots of time. Uh, there is something new in the Syrian society since 2011, and this is uh, sometimes the consequence of the terrible situation, is that many people either try to organize their, their local communities in order to survive the consequences of the war, or they might even have some democratic practices by electing local councils. This started in many areas that the opposition controlled. Uh, and women played a very important role. First, uh, this is terrible what I'm going to say, but it's part of the reality. The fact that many women are widows allowed them much more uh, space to be active in, in the society. They have more responsibilities. No one in a very conservative uh, village will tell them not to work. They have to work because they have kids, they have orphans at home. Uh, this is terrible, I'm sorry, but this is how sometimes it might function. But more important, in many places as well, due to the fact that women are working, even if they are not widows, that is giving them more power uh, at home, uh, and that is creating more equilibrium in the uh, patriarchal society that is Syria and that are many of the Middle Eastern societies. 
allowing women to occupy more place, to be more active, and to be more vocal as well. Plus, you have uh, all the activities of education. Even if uh, there are bombing and wars, and even if a large part of the Syrian children do not go to schools today, but there are still schools attracting, I don't know, maybe 20%, 30% of the Syrian kids that are run by women, by Syrian organizations, who try to receive funds, and they receive sometimes funds from some European donors or from some Syrian businessmen who mobilized for their own societies. So they organize those underground schools, and they put them in the underground also to avoid Air Force bombing, because they have been bombed on many occasions. Uh, the whole work in hospitals and dispensaries is also an important work in which women are mobilized, and the doctors uh, who work in Syria work in incredible conditions, sometimes uh, operating without uh, amnesia, amnesia, uh, amnesia, sometimes operating without electricity, you know, on the, on the mobile phone. Uh, and many doctors, and that's also important, and this is part of the beautiful solidarity internationally, Many doctors from France, from Britain, from the US, especially in Chicago, there is a large Syrian-American association operated by Skype sometimes and by primitive techniques in terms of Skype. We're not talking about satellite operation, but they help in operations, in besieged Aleppo, in many places. Uh, the white helmets uh, that saved more than 60,000 Syrians uh, during the conflict, uh, they worked like a very efficient group with very scarce resources. So you have lots of forms of, of resilience, lots of expression. If you see the number of writers and authors and artists, female and male Syrians today, you will be astonished that under war you have this uh, creative uh, society, maybe because also they want to uh, end with silence, uh, to confront death by trying to, to talk as much as possible. I always use this metaphor of Proust, uh, his book, A la recherche du temps per perdu, uh, looking for the last lost time, uh, or uh, yes, is this the English translation? <laughs> the, the title, <laughs> looking for the last time. It is really, in many Arab societies, as if people are looking for the lost time, that time that passed under dictatorship, with silence, with wars of fears. So as if they want to talk, uh, after 40 years of shutting their mouth up, and and they want to to return to life, even if death is always there as well, not to allow them to continue. But that has been an important factor, and I think the potential for the reconstruction of the Syrian society is very important, uh, due to the fact that resilience was there, uh, medical work, relief work, uh, humanitarian work. When, when we say that there are seven million <coughs> internally displaced, it means also that there are many people who hosted them, who offered hospitality. Hmm? Not all of that, because also there is an economy of war and there are people who will abuse and you have rents that will become much more expensive. All of this also exploitation, all of that exists. But there are also beautiful scenes of solidarity, beautiful stories that will keep this human tissue, the social tissue of Syria alive if there is a ceasefire and if violence is over and if a political transition is possible. So I think we have as well hope, as I tried to show with the last uh, uh, images that you saw. Yes, John. Uh, we've seen in the past that um, diverse demographics in a country can cause conflict and tension. Do you, do you foresee that, um, given the displacement of Syrian people, there will be a knock-on effect of, of, of problems in the future in, in, in the neighboring countries, like Turkey, say, to 20 million uh, Syrian immigrants coming in. So we've seen already problems happening in Lebanon. Yes. In the neighboring countries, you see that being a, a, a future problem in the next 20, 30, 50, 100 years, <coughs> but um, of causing political tensions and, and social tensions. Yes, well, this will, will bring us into some details. Um, just to tell you that 90% of the Syrian refugees are Muslim Sunnis, if not more. So that creates some problems in a country like Lebanon, uh, where for the very fragile uh, balance between uh, the different communities, where you have 30% of the population that is Shia, 30% that is Sunni, 30% that is Christian, and then smaller minorities, Druze and others. Many also fear that the Syrian refugees, if they are there to stay, and they are already 1.1 million in a population of 4.5 million, the Lebanese, that if they stay, that will create uh, this kind of uh, non-balance, let's say, between communities. These are fears that will uh, disappear if Syrian refugees return, but for them to return once again, 
a peaceful and political solution should be found, which is not the case for now. For Turkey, it's not a big deal. Turkey is an 80 million uh, population, so they can have 2.8 million. They are dealing with it. And from time to time, uh, that's another aspect of the Syrian tragedy, there will be a dispute between Turkey and Europe. So Europe will pay the Turkish authorities to keep the refugees there. When they do not pay, Turkey allows some of the refugees to uh, cross the sea and try to arrive to Greece and then to Europe. And that has been uh, uh, terrible, but part of the Turkish European realities. Uh, Europe does not want to see refugees. Uh, they are sometimes letting them die in the sea or uh, wait in, in camps with minus eight degrees in Belgrade and in, in, uh, in Greece, uh, not to see them here because strangers are not always uh, welcome. And they want to keep paying Turkey to keep, it, uh, to keep them there, while Turkey is saying that they are not paying. And it's, it's part of the problem. Uh, but there should be a certain policy allowing them to return based on the reconciliation, the reconstruction, and the political solution. Otherwise, definitely it's a destabilizing factor for many countries, especially for Lebanon and Jordan. And not to talk about Iraq, where you have already more than 4 million internally displaced Iraqis. Shia and Sunnah and Kurds and Yazidis and with all the disasters that Daesh created as well there and with the terrible mistakes uh, of the Iraqi government, the, the one of Baghdad and with the Iranian intervention, all of that will keep, those societies will keep producing refugees and refugees will keep trying to arrive. You cannot only construct walls in order not to allow them to cross or not to see them. You need political measures. It's much easier to find a solution in a place that is exporting refugees than to keep building walls. Uh, so uh, the international community, and that's why Syria and the world again, the international community does have lots of responsibilities and can at least make the uh, refugees living in neighboring countries uh, live in decent conditions, which is not the case today. It's not only the responsibility of the international community, it's also the responsibility of the government of Lebanon, of Jordan, of Iraq, and of Turkey. And in the Lebanese case, many of the Syrian refugees are uh, living in terrible conditions, unacceptable conditions. Okay, so I'm receiving some orders, in fact, to, to end with our uh, discussions. Uh, I thank you un once again. I thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a drink and to ask more questions. With pleasure.